Okay, so welcome everyone for attending the um, Institute for Precision Medicine monthly seminar. And this month we are super excited to host um, uh, Amanda Palovich, MD, PhD, as our guest speaker. Amanda is the Avon Foundation Endowed Chair and Director of the CLIA Targeted Proteomic Laboratory at the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Research Center. She also serves as Director of the Clinical Research Proteomics Platform at the Brockman Beatty Institute for Precision Medicine and is a professor of medicine in the Division of Oncology at University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Palovich received her MD and PhD uh, with Lee Hartwell at the University of Washington, who many of you I'm sure know. She completed a residency in internal medicine at Mass General and a fellowship in oncology at uh, Dana-Farber. So she was obviously Boston embedded. She completed a uh, postdoctoral training at MIT Whitehead with, uh, for genomics research, working with Dr. Eric Lander, I'm sure you all know as well. Um, having spent all that time learning about genomics and being in Genomics Institute, she then decides to do proteomics as her passion for her research career. And for um, the last 18 years has been a leader in the development of uh, quanti quantitative proteomics, particularly in oncology. Um, she was inducted, as she's won many of the awards, she was inducted to the American Society for Clinical Investigation and receives, has received a number of other um, Life Sciences Award uh, over time. In our presentation today, um, Dr. Palovich is going to discuss uh, proteogenomics and the value of adding proteomics over the current uh, genomics in precision medicine. Mandy, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Adrian, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. So precision oncology is largely genome driven but patient selection is still the challenge. Many tumors don't respond to genomically predicted therapies and most initially responsive tumors become resistant to treatment. So how can we make the genome more actionable to help improve outcomes for our patients? One issue is that genomic profiles do not reliably predict alterations in protein expression or function. Across 14 human cancers where it's been systematically examined, the correlation between DNA, RNA, and protein expression levels is marginal, and there is virtually no correlation with post-translational modifications of proteins. This, of course, is not surprising because many processes downstream of the genome can affect the tumor phenotype. Genes are expressed as proteins, and proteins both dictate the phenotype of tumors, and since most modern therapies target proteins, it's critical that we be able to quantify proteins and post-translational modifications directly. Unfortunately, most human proteins can't be reliably quantified in clinical settings. While we have next-gen technologies for looking at nucleic acids, Protein-based assays are largely dependent upon conventional immunoassay platforms, which have taken us a long way and will continue to play a role, but which also are associated with analytical issues that make them alone inadequate to meet the needs of a post-genomic research community. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is work that we and others have been doing largely through the National Cancer Institute's clinical proteomic program to try and solve this technological gap and fill in next-gen capabilities for the quantification of proteins and protein networks. These technologies are based on mass spectrometry. And the National Cancer Institute's clinical proteomic program, also known as CPTAC, is a consortium of centers of excellence in mass spectrometry-based proteomics. And my laboratory has been very fortunate to be a part of this program for 15 years now. The program focuses on the use of mass spectrometry to detect and measure proteins. And briefly, in, in a mass spec platform, we extract proteins from biospecimens, for example, tissue biopsies, and then we proteolize that protein lysate with enzymes, most commonly trypsin. And this produces predictable peptides based on the genome sequence of the organism from which the protein arose. And these peptides upstream of the mass spectrometer are ionized and nebulized into the gas phase to produce what are called precursor ions. 
Each precursor ion has a characteristic mass to charge ratio, or M over Z, and this is determined by the primary amino acid sequence of the peptide. Within the mass spec, these precursor ions are bombarded with inert gas molecules that induces them to fragment at their peptide bonds, producing a series of fragment ions, each one of which has its own characteristic mass to charge ratio. These fragment ions then ping the detector of the mass spectrometer to produce a mass fingerprint, which can be searched back against to the genome sequence of the organism from which the proteome was extracted in order to infer the sequence of the peptide that gave rise to the mass fingerprint. Now, broadly speaking, we do two types of mass spectrometry, untargeted and targeted. In untargeted mass spectrometry, we try to perform a global survey of as many proteins as we can in a biospecimen. The genomic equivalent of this would be a whole transcriptome RNA-seq profile or whole exome sequencing. With modern technologies, we routinely see 9 to 11,000 proteins. And as I'll talk about later, we also can get rather deep coverage of several post-translational modifications as well. In contrast, targeted mass spectrometry, and I'll focus today on a form of that called MRM, which stands for Multiple Reaction Monitoring Mass Spectrometry. Here, we don't try to do a global survey of everything, but instead we have specific proteins that we want to detect and quantify with high sensitivity, specificity, and precision with a highly validated assay. The genomic equivalent of that would be a highly validated quantitative PCR reaction to look at a particular transcript of interest. Now we can combine untargeted or so-called shotgun mass spectrometry and the targeted form of mass spectrometry in sequence to support a biomarker translation program. And I'll talk briefly about that as well. So within this clinical proteomic network at the National Cancer Institute, we use the untargeted form of mass spectrometry to generate proteomic profiles and combine them with genomic profiles across multiple human cancer types to produce public resources for hypothesis-driven science about these various tumors. Interesting findings identified through these public resources must be validated downstream using higher throughput, more quantitative assays. And that's where the targeted mass spectrometry comes in. And I'm gonna talk briefly about how that works here. So MRM mass spectrometry is performed on specialized instruments, typically triple quadruple mass spectrometers. These instruments can be programmed or tuned to look specifically for proteins of interest in the complex biospecimen. By tuning the instrument to focus on those proteins of, instrument, of interest and ignoring everything else in the complex sample, we greatly improve the sensitivity for detection of protein of interest over untargeted shotgun methods. Furthermore, we can make MRM assays quantitative by synthesizing and spiking into every biospecimen an isotopic labeled version of every protein that we're targeting for measurement. These spiked in internal standards go through the workflow within each biospecimen, controlling for much of the pre-analytical and all of the analytical variation in the assay. And because they have a slightly different mass than the patient's protein, the mass spectrometer can see the heavy spiked in standard as a separate peak from the light patient signal from the, light, the patient's protein. And because the heavy labeled standard is spiked in at a known concentration, we can use the peak area ratios of the light to the heavy signal to perform precise relative quantification of the protein in the patient sample. Now, if we break open human cells, there are between five and 7,000 proteins that can be quantified directly by MRM mass spectrometry. If you wanna look deeper than that to lower abundance proteins, or see most post-translational modifications, or see most proteins in plasma, an enrichment step is required. This can be accomplished in some cases using biochemical enrichments, but where possible, we much prefer to have an antibody to perform immuno enrichment of the patient's peptides from the protein of interest 
as well as the spiked in standard version. In, in, and in, in these enrichments, we get on the order of 10,000 fold enrichments. And then those selected peptides can be subjected to MRM mass spectrometry, producing a much more sensitive assay for detecting lower abundant targets. As I'll show you in the upcoming slides, these assays are highly precise, properly performed. They approach absolute specificity because the mass spectrometer is the detector here, and we have a partial mass spectrum of everything that we're quantifying. They have a large linear range of three, four, or more orders of magnitude. And the high specificity coupled to the large linear range mean that these assays are readily multiplexed. Furthermore, We've shown that through the sharing of these internal standards, these assays can be readily harmonized across laboratories, even on an international stage. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples from the CPTAC program of projects that we're involved in that A, demonstrate the added value of proteomics and B, demonstrate the sequential use of untargeted and targeted proteomics. In this example, this is a a study that we did on pediatric brain cancers and published at the end of last year. We had a cohort of 218 tumors, which we performed genomic and proteomic profiling of. And here's an example of how the proteomics added value. If we look at the global proteomic profiles, we can discern two subclusters of pediatric craniopharyngiomas, a C4 subcluster, that co-clusters with BRAF wild-type low-grade gliomas and a C8 subcluster that co-clusters with BRAF wild-type low-grade gliomas. Of note, these subclusters of craniopharyngioma were not evident in either the transcriptional or the mutational profiles of these tumors. And so only the proteomic data actually uncovered this part of the biology. Furthermore, if we now look in the phosphoproteomic profiling data, based on the expression level of specific phosphopeptides, we can infer the activity of kinases in individual tumor samples. And we're able to confirm that in the C4 subcluster of craniopharyngiomas, which co-cluster with the BRAF uh, mutant low-grade gliomas, uh, there is indeed hyperactivity of the MEK kinase. And so this supports the potential use of MEK kinase inhibitors in pediatric patients with C4 subtypes of craniopharyngiomas and our neuro-oncology, uh, pediatric neuro-oncology collaborators are now moving toward a clinical trial to test that. So downstream of that proteogenomic um, survey experiment where we discover things, we need to validate things with more analytical rigor and higher throughput. And for that, we turn to targeted mass spectrometry, where for this project, we developed the 77 plex immuno MRM assay. So again, these are readily multiplexed that targeted 77 peptides, including 21 post-translational modifications mapping to 40 proteins. And these were proteins that were selected from the global surveys to be uh, candidate biomarkers for subtyping these pediatric brain tumors into the different classes in order to help select patients for um, clinical trials. And so the last point I wanna make about this project is, this is a recurrent theme that perhaps not surprisingly, cancer phenotypes are complex. These aren't single gene traits. And in many of these projects, you're looking at a highly multiplex assay in order to encompass or capture the biology behind a phenotype of interest. So diagnostic tests for these types of complex phenotypes are going to require multiplexable platforms. And this is where we think this targeted MRM mass spectrometry could be highly useful to help fill in this technological gap. I'm going to briefly just overview the ongoing project that I co-lead in the CPTAC network with Mike Beer, a gynecologic oncologist. And our project is focused on understanding drivers and mechanisms of resistance to high-grade serous ovarian cancers. And our goals are to develop a predictor of platinum resistant or refractory disease with a special focus on being able to do upfront prediction of exceptional non-responders. The 15 or so percent of high-grade serous cases that in fact progress 
on platinum. And most of these patients become too sick to even participate in a clinical trial um, while they're getting their chemotherapy uh, before we figure out that it's not working. And so we'd like to predict these patients up front and we'd like to understand the mechanism of resistance so that we could implicate potential new drug targets for platinum resistant disease. This is a roadmap of this project that provides sort of a, a, a template so, to see how we think about putting these proteogenomic projects together. Uh, this is our current ovarian project and the degree of shading of these boxes kind of shows where we are uh, just coming to the end of four years into the project. But in general, you start with the preclinical arm where we have preclinical models that we can perturb, for example, exposed to platinum and perform proteogenomic profiling of sensitive and resistant models to try and discern differences. And then you combine those data with proteogenomic profiles of archived human tumors from patients who had sensitive and refractory disease in order to try and understand uh, both, as I mentioned, what might be good drug targets in resistant disease and can you predict um, responsiveness up front. In the case of platinum, there are 30 years of literature implicating putative biomarkers of platinum resistance. Of note, none of those has been translated clinically, in part because this is one of those complex cancer phenotypes that has multiple underlying mechanisms and is not going to be validated with a single one-off IHC assay, which picks up 5% of all the refractory cases, but rather is going to require a multiplex platform to encompass the complexity of those biological mechanisms. So we partner with our statistician colleagues to use um, machine learning algorithms, combining all of this information to identify candidates. And I won't talk about this today. We have a potential repurposed drug from the cardiovascular space, but we're still in um, Xenograt studies to try and validate that. I will briefly talk about the predictor and where we are with that. And, but first, I'm going to use the example of the cell lines in one slide just to give you an idea of the best case scenario. This is the current capability of modern state-of-the-art mass spec platforms to perform proteomic profiling. And so in those cell line experiments, the platform is able to detect over 11,000 proteins, over 55,000 post-translational modifications, over 35,000 serine threonine phosphorylations, over 16,000 ubiquitinations, over 3,400 acetylations on proteins, and hundreds of phosphotyrosine sites. All of those cell line experiments are done in complete biological and technical triplicates, and here across all of the experiments, um, the box plots show the replicate CVs for each one of these, for each of the five proteomes that I mentioned that were profiled. And you can see that properly executed, these experiments are highly reproducible with the median percent CV ranging between 3.6 and 11.9% across those biological and technical triplicates, which in fact was better performing than the transcriptional profiling that was performed in parallel. So I just present this to give an idea of the current capabilities uh, because the, the technologies have matured uh, a lot in the past 10 years. And then finally, the last slide on this project is um, an, uh, an exam another example of how we're gonna have to use multiple sources of data to get at these complex phenotypes. And so in this case, we leverage this preclinical model data from cell lines and PDX models as well as the literature curation to identify 1,170 proteins with some prior probability that they would have um, uh, get be some indicator of responsiveness to platinum. These then were um, analyzed using multiple prediction models trained on an archival set of formalin fixed paraffin embedded high grade serous ovarian cancers that were extracted from three different academic repositories through which these models converged on a set of 71 proteins that was able to identify a subset of refractory tumors with high specificity. We then went into a fourth academic repository to get an additional independent set of patient samples and were able to show the same 71 set of proteins retained activity in detecting a subset of these tumors. So this signature has been real world stress tested in archival samples that span 20 some years and in their collection date. 
and four different academic repositories. And we're now generating the multiplexed MRM assay that we need to try and validate this in legacy NCI trials in which platinum chemotherapy was used. And so um, the other point that this drives home, in addition to being another example of the need to be able to look in a multiplex fashion at, to discern some of these phenotypes, is the complexity of the phenotypes, right? So uh, there are, we, we detect a subset of the tumors, but there are other refractory tumors not picked up yet by this predictor um, after studying a, a couple of hundred tumors. And so this gives you an idea of the complexity of these phenotypes. This, this signature, even if, if um, validated, is still gonna miss some of these cases. So work like this and of our colleagues in this National Cancer Institute program has led to this new term, proteogenomics. And this is the fusion of proteomics and genomics wherein the genomic data are leveraged by, use, by enabling us to make customized databases for searching the mass spec data. And the proteomic data adds value in a couple of ways. One, by um, testing hypotheses generated from genomic observations, such as the expression of potential neoantigens, or the prioritization of, of uh, uh, genes, maybe in a, uh, an amplicon that uh, might be a driver mutation. And you'd like to know which of the 50 genes in the amplicon is actually expressed at the protein level and in fact overexpressed at the protein level. And the proteomic data provide that sort of support. And additionally, the proteomic data identifies unique biology beyond the genome and beyond the RNA with respect to protein levels and post-translational modifications, for example. And so having supported the proteogenomic analysis of 14 cancer types now uh, through the US NCI program and our international partnerships, the NCI uh, has now called this fusion of proteomics and genomics the next horizon in precision oncology. And in fact, uh, leadership of NCI published a perspective on this in uh, Cell in April of this year, and uh, proteogenomic approaches are included in the annual plan and budget for the NCI, with a specific focus on moving new proteogenomic diagnostic approaches into the clinic. And I'm going to spend much of the remainder of my time talking about this, because this is the major focus now and where we're trying to go. The clearest path forward into clinical applications is through the use of targeted MRM mass spec based assays. And the reason for that is that MRM is not new. It's been used for decades in clinical labs by clinical chemists to measure not proteins, but small molecules. So all of the newborns that get the heel pricks for blood spots, they get put on cards, they go to state reference labs and they get run by, analyzed by MRM mass spectrometry to measure not proteins, but metabolites that accumulate as a result of inborn errors of metabolism. And also MRM is used in clinical labs to detect the presence of drugs of abuse and to monitor therapeutic levels of multiple classes of drugs. So the quantification of these small molecules by MRM in clinical labs lays the groundwork for the quantification of proteins by MRM in the clinical setting. And that's what we've been working hard to translate. We've worked a lot over the years with the key stakeholders in this spectrum of moving this into the clinic, including the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, and the FDA, we have established industry guidelines for fit-for-purpose bioanalytical validation of MRM-based protein assays. The FDA has held public workshops on the topic and co-authored, along with members of my lab, um, a, a new CLSI document that was just published a month ago, uh, C64A, which is a guidance document for measurement of proteins and peptides by mass spectrometry in clinical laboratories. So we've laid down a, a, path, a pathway that leads toward a regulatory approval of protein-based targeted assays. And we have successfully translated one of these targeted assays into clinical use as a laboratory developed test. Uh, this is an assay that quantifies the cancer biomarker thyroglobulin 
A thyroglobulin is used not only to diagnose thyroid cancer, but to monitor patient response to treatment. And the problem with measuring thyroglobulin in the clinical labs is that about 20% of patients have autoantibodies that interfere with the clinical ELISA, and this can cause inaccurate results. What we were able to show in work done with our collaborator, Dr. Andy Hufnagel, here at the University Medical Center, is that the immuno-MRM assay for thyroglobulin circumvents the autoantibody in these patients and performs at least as well, if not better, than the clinical ELISA. As a result of that work, six clinical reference labs in the US and Canada are now running the thyroglobulin MRM assays, and this is being done reflexively in patients with known or suspected autoantibodies. So we can successfully take one of these assays out of the research setting and translate it as a laboratory developed test into a CLIA environment. I'm gonna give several examples of clinical and translational applications of these targeted assays. So in this case, one issue that the National Cancer Institute has in its precision oncology trials is that patient screening is a bottleneck. For example, there may be 30 to 50 antibody drug conjugates that they want to open up a precision medicine arm in their trial for. But in order to get enough patients into those arms, you have to be able to screen hundreds of patients a week times those 30 targets of those ADCs. And the traditional way of doing that is immunohistochemistry, and it's really a major bottleneck. And so I was asked whether a multiplexed MRM assay could help to relieve this bottleneck by measuring, for example, all 30 ADC targets at once in a single mass spec run on every patient's tumor to help triage patients for arms. So in order to uh, determine the feasibility for this, we did a study in which we developed a, uh, an immuno MRM assay for quantifying a, an active ADC target, which is the HER2 protein that's expressed on the surface of not just breast cancers, but um, cells from other cancer types as well. And there are new antibody drug targets that are very exciting and showing clinical activity um, towards uh, tumors that express this protein. Now I mentioned that we had translated a thyroglobulin laboratory assay into a laboratory developed test for measurement in plasma. Plasma is a relatively homogeneous biospecimen, but if we want to make these measurements in tissue, we have to deal with the fact that tissues are heterogeneous geographically within a tumor and between tumors. So one of the things we've been working hard on is developing strategies for dealing with the heterogeneity. And one of those strategies is to build a panel of assays to proteins that are markers or different subcompartments of tumor tissue, such as stroma, epithelium, uh, lymphocytes, uh, adipose, and so on, and multiplex all of these assays together with our tissue uh, biomarker in order to help uh, deal with this microheterogeneity. This multiplex assay went through its full normal bioanalytical validation and then was applied uh, on a set of approximately 200 breast cancers and the MRM results, in this case, normalized to the GAP-DH marker, which gave the best performance in this tumor, um, showed very high concordance with the predicate assays extracted from the PATH reports and the patient charts. And these were largely based on immunohistochemistry. And in fact, the false positive and false negative rate was totally in line with the expected error rates for the existing HER2 predicate assays. And where there was some overlap in potential discrepancy, in the few cases where we had transcriptional profiling and genomic profiling of the tumors, those corroborated the MRM data. So the assay is performing in a very robust fashion uh, with good concordance to predicate assays. And importantly, the assay is capable of quantifying HER2 protein in all of these tumors that conventionally are scored as HER2 negative, and not only that, but detects a 70-fold range of HER2 protein expression amongst these HER2 low tumors, which is very intriguing because these new HER2 targeting therapies that are just being tested in clinical trials now are showing activity in a subset of these patients that we typically call HER2 negative. 
And so this obviously is a direction that we would like to do further testing to see if the more quantitative MRM-based assay might be leveraged to help select patients for these newer therapies. So towards that end, as well as this goal of trying to help triage patients uh, for precision oncology trials, we have developed in my laboratory at Fred Hutch, a dedicated CLIA lab, uh, whose goal is to run MRM assays to support clinical trials. We have CLIA certified our HER2 immuno MRM assay and are currently working on a PDL1 assay, and we're working on CAP certification. We also went to the FDA and put in a full pre-submission packet with the intended use of our, for our immuno-MRM HER2 assay for patient screening and precision oncology trials. And this was a very useful experience because it now has taught us what it will take to flip these assays out of the CLIA LDT setting into the regulatory space, for example, as a companion diagnostic. And this is just one um, quick aside, which is to point out that we can also run these assays on bone biopsies. And the reason this is important is that, for example, in breast cancer, bone is a common site of metastasis. And the biomarker expression in the um, tumor recurrences in the bone are not always in agreement with the biomarker status of the primary tumor. And so it's important to do bone biopsies at recurrence in order to reassess ERPR and HER2 to make sure that we are proper, properly guiding treatment in that setting. The issue is that the way the assays are typically run, decalcifying agents are used to allow the bones to be sectioned and that can affect the accuracy and feasibility of determining these biomarkers using conventional assays. And what we showed, it showed in this uh, pilot study here was that we could take the bone biopsy and directly extract protein from it and get good determinations of these biomarker levels, even in biopsies where the conventional assays had failed. So this is something else that we would like to move forward into more uh, bigger validation studies. So what we think of is a day when these thematic MRM assay panels um, don't replace conventional platforms like IHC. There's really a lot of complementarity between those and the MRM emerging platform. But instead, when an anatomical pathologist is looking at a patient's tumor, just like he or she might order special stains to further characterize the tumor, the dream is that in the future, we give them more tools in their toolkit, such as thematic MRM assay panels to ask, is MAP kinase signaling active in my tumor, for example? Is the HER2 protein um, expressed, and what about the other EGF family members that might affect uh, my uh, response to treatment? Uh, they, they now would have the ability to order MRM panels, and this would provide an even closer partnership between anatomic and clinical pathologists, since the clinical pathologists are already running MRM assays for small molecules, there's a natural extension of this uh, forward into uh, measurements of proteins. And then the goal would be that this would provide a deeper, more comprehensive readout of the tumor biology to better predict drug response, and that instead of sending genomic reports to tumor boards, in the future we'll be sending proteogenomic port reports with a more refined understanding of what's happening in real time in a patient's tumor. Now, MRM can also be used for pharmacodynamic and mechanism of action studies. This is an example of that using the um, cellular response to DNA damage, which is a major therapeutic target for development of cancer therapies. And in response to DNA damage, the, our, our cells uh, activate an extensive phosphosignaling network and the ultimate signaling kinase in that network in response to DNA double-stranded breaks is the ATM protein kinase. And so in order to um, identify good pharmacodynamic biomarkers of ATM kinase activity, this is another example of where we start with untargeted proteomics and we do proteomic profiling of human peripheral blood cells after DNA damage induction by ionizing radiation. We identify a couple of thousand phosphocytes that are regulated in response to that DNA damage. And then if we want to use those downstream, again, we have to convert that to 
and validated higher throughput, more quantitative MRM assays for implementation in clinical studies. So we have developed um, many assays to all of these different sub-branches of the DNA damage response units uh, reflected here in this radar plot, homologous recombination, non-homologous end joining, mismatch repair, and, and so on. And now we can configure these into different multiplex panels to apply them in clinical and translational work. Here's an example of a 135-plex MRM assay that we use for pharmacodynamic measurements of this DNA damage response in human lymphocytes. And here you can see the five of the analytes are extracted here, and you can see over time, these pharmacodynamic curves of these lymphocytes responding to DNA damage induced by ionizing radiation. And these are five of 135 analytes. You can flip through all 135 and just look at these beautiful pharmacodynamic curves. All of this is generated in a less than one hour mass spec run per each of these time points. And this replaces 135 Western blots with precise and highly specific quantitative data. So you can make these really nice pharmacodynamic measurements. And in fact, um, we did a collaboration with AstraZeneca who had a lead compound headed into early phase clinical trials. And this was an inhibitor of that ATM protein kinase. And the folks at AstraZeneca had tried for a long time using conventional approaches to identify a good pharmacodynamic biomarker for their lead compound and had been unable to do so. And they came and asked whether this platform could help. And we were able to quickly identify a novel phosphocyte on the RAD50 protein that showed a high dynamic range response to the induction of DNA damage, which showed um, a severe suppression in the presence of their lead compound ATM inhibitor. AstraZeneca went on to validate this uh, biomarker with orthogonal assays in cell lines and xenografts and human tumors uh, in-house at AstraZeneca. And this has now been incorporated uh, into their clinical trials with this compound. We published this paper at the end of 2018. And to my knowledge, this is still the first and only example of the use of a targeted mass spec platform to identify a novel pharmacodynamic biomarker uh, for clinical trials. We uh, actually recently published another uh, set of uh, assays, multiplex MRM assays that allow uh, measurement of proteins and uh, signaling related phosphorylations through the receptor tyrosine kinase, MAP kinase, and AKT signaling networks. Uh, these assays have all gone through a full bioanalytical validation. They show good uh, reproducibility across laboratories. And for people who still like to do Western blots, you can line them up nicely where you have a good antibody for a Western blot and see that the mass spec data um, align uh, nicely with the, the semi-quantitative Western blot data. In fact, it was a subset of these assays that was incorporated into that custom immuno MRM assay I mentioned previously in which we subtyped pediatric brain cancers uh, to identify those which had hyperactivation of the MEK kinase. Uh, this is something that's an ongoing project in the lab. It's a follow-up of a untargeted mass spec profiling experiment we did in collaboration with Stan Riddell's lab where we detected uh, signaling events through CAR T receptors. And out of those data, we have identified phosphorylations that we think might be useful for predicting efficacy and toxicity of CAR T constructs. And we're working now to convert that into a multiplexed MRM assay to be used in the preclinical setting to characterize these novel CAR T constructs upstream of animal and human studies. In a large project associated with the Bo Biden National Cancer Moonshot, we were uh, funded to develop MRM-based assays to quantify uh, immunomodulatory and inflammation-related proteins to support immuno-oncology uh, trials and therapeutic development. Expert panel in immuno-oncology was convened to nominate protein targets, and my laboratory was um, tasked with building those assays. So we've built hundreds of these assays. I'm not gonna go through the slide, but they all go through extensive bioanalytical validation. They get validated in a fit for purpose manner in the background matrices of intended use, such as a formerly fixed paraffin embedded tumor or plasma or uh, frozen tumors. 
and then they get applied to samples. And in our um, early work with these immuno-oncology assays, whether we look in plasma or tumor uh, across different patients, and these are just a couple of the proteins targeted in the panel, we see a wide range of variation amongst humans. And this now, of course, raises the question of whether this interpatient variation correlates with clinically important phenotypes such as response to therapy or the development of immune-related adverse events. And so to that end, we're leveraging our CLIA environment to now begin running these assays in the setting of clinical trials, uh, both with the Cancer Immunotherapy Trials Network, where we've started, uh, just finished producing data for the CITN10 trial, which was a phase two study of cutaneous lymphomas that were be being treated uh, with the PD-1 inhibitor, pembrolizumab. And uh, the, the, what you see here, and these are a subset of the patients in the trial, and e each one of these clusters is a different patient. Again, you see this is just one analyte in the panel. You see a lot of interpatient variation. And again, within a patient, you see these interesting longitudinal changes in some but not all of the patients. And so it will be really interesting to see, and the, status, the, the trial statisticians are working up the data now, whether any of these markers in the panel correlates with the adverse events or responsiveness. Uh, this is a second example of a, a use of these assays in the setting of a, a clinical trial. These are, and this is in partnership with our colleagues at Seattle Children's Hospital in their brainchild studies where they are treating relapsed or refractory brain tumors in children with intrathecal injections of CAR T cells, uh, and then sampling longitudinally over time, uh, both the CSF and the plasma. And this has been quite interesting. It not only established the feasibility of using plasma or CSF for these measurements, but whereas in the plasma, you might see a couple of full change in an immunomodulatory protein over time, in the CSF, we see hundreds of fold changes in this proximal fluid, um, up to 1,300 fold for one of the markers. And this has raised a really interesting question that we're trying to tease out of whether any of these might be an early indicator of responsiveness to the therapy. Because as many of you know, it's difficult to interpret uh, medical imaging in the setting of immunotherapies because the tumors appear to get worse before they get better due to an inflama inflammatory response. And so the question is whether we can pick up a response earlier than is possible with imaging using one of these biochemical markers. Okay, and I'm gonna turn in the end of the talk of just a few um, things that we're building out now. We haven't built yet, but that we're currently working on that we think have um, potentially medically uh, useful applications. So um, my laboratory has now validated over 1,700 of these MRM-based assays. We have built 512 custom monoclonals validated in this platform and have a highly active project with almost 200 additional antibodies in our pipeline. These can all be run in our CLIA environment. So now um, how do we put these together and, and, and start to translate them more? So I'm gonna come back to this notion of uh, antibody drug conjugates because there's a really fun opportunity here, I think. So for anybody who doesn't know, antibody drug conjugates are monoclonal antibodies that bind proteins on the surface of cancer cells. And we attach to these antibodies through a linker, a payload, which is a, a something that induces cytotoxicity. So the idea is that the antibody pulls the payload along, it gets internalized into the cancer cell, it kills the cancer cell, but it avoids damaging normal tissues around the body and therefore reduces the toxicity. Now, there are many tens of proteins for which there are ADCs uh, under development or already developed and in clinical trials. And the vast majority of them have uh, either a payload that induces DNA damage or is a microtubule poison. So you can imagine that with the multiplex platform that we have, you could develop an assay that would have a generic base panel to detect cellular targets of the DNA damage response or micro, the microtubule poisons, as well as the pharmacodynamic responses that would be expected downstream. And into that assay, you could multiplex as many targets of antibody drug conjugates as you wanted to, to support your precision oncology trial. Or in the case of HER2, which is what we're currently building out, 
for deeper studies of HER2 targeting antibody drug conjugates. So in this case, we already have assays now built to three of the four EGF family members that can affect the internalization of this antibody drug conjugate into the cancer cells. We have an assay already to the cellular target, in this case, DNA topoisomerase 1. And as I already showed you, we have hundreds of assays to the DNA damage response that would get activated uh, in response to the delivery of this payload. So the single multiplex assay could in theory be useful not only for patient selection, but for pharmacodynamic and mechanism of action studies. And we're also working on a new assay to the MET protein to detect amplification, which is associated with resistance. And so this is something that we're currently developing and would like to clinically test in the coming year. So another example of an emerging opportunity that we hope to take advantage of in the coming year is in the setting of this hereditary cancer-prone syndrome called Lynch syndrome. And Lynch syndrome is due to germline mutations in a number of genes that affect the DNA mismatch repair system in our cells. And the mismatch repair system's job is to proofread our DNA for errors that get introduced during DNA replication. And if you're born with a defect in the mismatch repair system, your cells are genomically unstable and they have mutations and microsatellite instability. As a result of this genetic instability, you have a very high lifetime risk of cancer, 80% or higher. In fact, remarkably, two to 4% of all cancers are defective in mismatch repair. And in, in just a particular association with colorectal and endometrial cancers. And this association is so high that ASCO recommends tumor testing for Lynch syndrome in all people diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And recent guidelines are moving toward that recommendation also for endometrial cancer. So being able to reliably test for Lynch syndrome, both in the germline and somatically in tumors is important, not only for risk assessment and early detection of cancers in folks who inherit this disease, but also, as I'll explain in the next slide, for precision oncology efforts. And so the, the tumors that arise in the setting of Lynch syndrome have genomic instability, which means they have a lot of mutations. Their mutational load is 10 to 100 times higher than sporadic tumors that occur outside of the Lynch syndrome. And many of these mutations are frame shift mutations that put the whole protein out of frame downstream and can lead to the development of many neoantigens. So abnormal uh, proteins that aren't, aren't normally expressed and uh, our immune system is not tolerated to. And these can be presented uh, in the context of MHC on the surface of tumor cells and can be recognized by T cells in our body and used as a, a way for the, our immune system to find and kill tumor cells. Of course, as you all probably know, our tumor cells have learned to get around this by expressing immune checkpoint proteins like PDL1 that put the brakes on these T cells and enable them to escape. And that's the basis of one of our pillars of immunotherapy. Uh, for example, PDL1 inhibitors that turn this break off and reactivate the immune response. And so it's really important that we be able to know which tumors are defective in mismatch repair and might benefit from these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so, uh, in fact, loss of mismatch repair proteins, such as those Lynch syndrome proteins, is clinically proven to be a predictive biomarker for response to immune checkpoint inhibition. And there's a new FDA approved IHC multiplex assay for looking at the Lynch syndrome proteins in the tumor tissue. Now we have validated assays to all of these Lynch syndrome proteins in addition to not only PDL1 and PD1, but lots of immunomodulatory proteins, all of which could be multiplexed into a single assay for quantitative measurement of this entire axis. And that's something that we'll be working um, on um, over the next year as well. And then finally, one more example of a hereditary cancer prone syndrome uh, where we think we can have an impact in the coming year. Uh, this is Fanconi anemia, which is uh, due to uh, defects in DNA repair processes that um, uh, repair different types of DNA damage, but especially DNA cross-linking agents. 
So patients who inherit this disease um, uh, used to die of bone marrow failure and leukemia at a young age, and we've gotten uh, better at treating those, and they're now living into their 20s and 30s, at which point these patients are now beginning to develop solid tumors, and in particular, squamous cell carcinomas, particularly of the head and neck. And so the definitive diagnosis for this disease is a functional chromosome breakage test where peripheral blood mononuclear cells are cultured in the laboratory and exposed to DNA damaging agents. And then you come back a day or two later and count the number of breaks. And this is laborious and difficult to standardize and genomic methods have been brought to bear, but the genomic uh, uh, signatures have been very hard to interpret for a variety of reasons. And this pathway encompasses at least 22 genes that can give rise to this phenotype. So the question is, can MRM mass spec play a role here? And we think that it can. And the biology is very interesting. There's a, the Fanconi D2 protein gets ubiquitinated in response to DNA damage in a normal cell. But if there's any defect in this entire upstream Fanconi core protein complex, this monoubiquitination doesn't occur. And 90% of Fanconi cases in the US are due to defects in this core complex. And so we've developed an immuno MRM assay to quantify the unmodified and the ubiquitinated FANC D2 protein and show the feasibility of using this assay to detect defects in the FANC8 core complex as well as the Fanconi D2 protein in peripheral blood mononucleosides from patients born with this heritable cancer chrome disorder. The assay is now being used to screen transgenic models of Fanconi and, and we're gearing up to do some pilot studies uh, toward the feasibility of uh, using this on blood draws from Fanconi patients as a potential FA diagnostic to complement the genomics. Another thing down the road we're interested in testing is whether this assay can predict tumors responses to platinum or PARP inhibitors, since we know defects in this Fanconi pathway confer sensitivity to these agents. And finally, the last emerging application before I end, uh, we've published several feasibility studies now showing that we can make MRM-based measurements of proteins expressed in lymphocytes off of these dried blood cards that are collected on every newborn for newborn screening for inborn errors of metabolism. And the ultimate goal here would be to see if we can extend newborn screening to additional diseases beyond inborn errors of metabolism, other diseases that would benefit from early detection and intervention, such as Wilson's disease or primary immunodeficiencies, which we've published in these pilot studies that we've done. And this is something that we would like to carry forward further toward the clinical application as well. So I'll just end by saying that while we live in a world now where precision oncology is driven uh, largely by the genome, there's a lot of uh, complexity beyond the genome that has a major impact on these clinically important phenotypes. And I think um, the, the institutions that are gonna own the day moving forward in precision oncology are ones that embrace this proteogenomic approach. And not only that, but have the capability to integrate clinical data and in, especially if the possibility exists to do longitudinal sampling of patients where the statistical power is even gonna be much higher than general population studies to create knowledge graphs that we can use to build predictive models with the hope of developing novel based diagnostics, support value-based care, equitable precision in medicine and improved outcomes for our patients. So it's been a long 18 year arc from a, um, young oncologist uh, treating patients and where I was both frustrated and fascinated by the variation I saw from patient to patient in both response to therapy as well as toxicity, the realization that these were complex traits that single genetic markers weren't going to solve through multiple iterations of our NCI program showing that mass spec can be applied to proteomics, that it adds value over genomics, laying the groundwork for clinical translation, developing CLIA environment to run these assays, and then ultimately uh, for the first time this year, being now incorporated into clinical trials. And so when a medical oncologist builds and leads a translational proteomic laboratory, uh, this is clearly evidence of a smart team uh, being involved, an interdisciplinary team. And I've been blessed to be part of an amazing team locally and nationally.
This is the core group of people in my lab, many of whom have been with me for a lot of this 18 year journey and invented much of what I have presented today. And then uh, we have had fantastic and invaluable collaborations over the past 15 years to the National Cancer Institute's clinical proteomic program run by Dr. Henry Rodriguez, who's a force of nature. And more recently through the um, Apollo Network, which under the Beau Biden National Cancer Moonshot is a tripartite collaboration between the NCI, which we represent in the network, the DOD and the Veterans Administration. So thank you very much for your time. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions if there's enough time left. Andy, that was fantastic. That was a tour de force of, uh, from basic science all the way to clinical implementation. Really, yeah, really amazing. If anyone wants to ask questions, they're welcome to put them into the chat or they can put them into the Q&A. And I'll take the privilege of the first one. What's the challenges for doing this on FFPE? I guess there are two points to this. One. Can you do the untargeted on FFPE? And then with the targeted, what's the challenges? You know, what happens when you compare frozen versus FFPE to the targeted assay? Presumably it doesn't perform as well on FFPE. And so how do you how do you handle that? Yes, it's feasible to do both untargeted and targeted on FFPE. And um, the issues of uh, doing that uh, are really the same as with IHC. Um, that is, if you want to look at labile biomarkers such as phosphorylations, the FFPE samples are associated with a lot more pre-analytical variation. Uh, so you have to be wary of that and make sure you do val validation around that. Um, the, the challenges are um, really, um, right now we're working on more efficient ways to process those samples to maximize the protein yield we get out of FFPE sections. Uh, we currently do these as individual sections because the yield was higher than with curls. And so that can get bogged down and be labor intensive, but the assays actually perform quite well. You might target different peptides in FFP than in, in uh, frozen tumors uh, because of the, you know, the cross-linking and, and some of those not being reversed, but we really, we have a large experience with this. You know, there were, there we've done 200 ovarian FFP tumors for the global profiling and got you know, 11,000 proteins out of that. And it's really not an issue. Hmm. Well, that's fantastic. And Steffi asked about the costs for, for instance, the HER2 assay, particularly if you're going to introduce it into clinical practice and IHC is pretty cheap nowadays. How, what is that? Yeah, it's on oh, the order that. of hundreds of dollars, depending on the kind of project that it's embedded in. So it's more than an IHC assay, but it's not ridiculously more. Yeah, it's not astronomical. Though. It's not like it's... For those anyway. yeah. and, and, and especially in the, the real value too is going to come in, I mean, not only with multiplexing, because clearly the thyroglobulin assay as a single plex assay added value, but certainly when it comes time to predict these complex phenotypes, and you need to measure many proteins in order to do that reliably, then it becomes very cost effective because the per analyte cost gets driven way down. And then can I ask, how long does it take to set up the assay? I know this is kind of, say you have a hundred proteins you've found in an, in a, from an untargeted thing. You say, well, I really want to measure those in, you know, some FFPE samples. How, and I know you can't give a specific answer to this, but how much effort and time goes into that development of the hundred plex assay? I know you can't say it precisely. Is that like a one month, three month, six month, year, five year? How long does that generally take, would you say? So the major determinant of that is whether or not you need to generate de novo antibodies or whether you can directly measure the proteins by MRM because the antibodies become the rate limiting step. If you can measure them directly by MRM, it might take four to six weeks to get synthesis and QC of your standards that are gonna spiked in. And to go through that entire full industry standard bioanalytic validation process might take another six or eight weeks. And then you'll have a validated assay at the end of that. So what's that three, four months, maybe three or four months for a hundred plex assay. If you need to make an antibody, then you're really just dependent on the time it takes to get the, the antibody. And some antibodies go quickly and you get those in six months and other antibodies, you go back for multiple rounds of immunizations and that can get dragged out longer. And so that's a little harder to, to give a direct answer to, because it just depends on the antibodies. Great. Well, we are just past five, so we will call it quits. Thank you, everyone, for dialing in. Thank you, Mandy, for that talk. It was really fantastic. Super, super Thanks. exciting and super informative. Thanks, everybody, for your time.
Thanks, everyone. Bye.